Mrs. Jackie Marie Beyer. I am the host of the Organic Gardener podcast, which I've been doing for four years. We just celebrated four years in January 29th. Um, and I get to live in well, what I, this beautiful organic oasis. So I asked if you were here earlier, if you wanted to write down on your card, what are some things you think would be in an organic o oasis? And so the teacher of me is going to take your ideas and put them on the board. Water. Good. Plants and containers and houses that in, invite wildlife and bugs and birds and things. Inviting. Worms. Uh... Anything else? Um, soil. Soil? Oh, excellent. It could be like a little retreat, too. Sure. Let's see. Let's see. Place to sit. Place to Replace sit. Place to sit. Sure. Compost pile. Compost pile. Food. No pesticides. No pesticides. Should be pretty. Smell yeah. good. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Anything else? Walk walkways. Walkways. Be a mix of sun and shade. Sun and shade. Why am I here? You guys know everything. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, this is where I get to spend most of my summers when I'm home. Uh, I personally believe an organic oasis is not just a space where food is grown, but so much more. I think it's a place where you'll want to spend most of your time when the weather is nice. A place to relax and enjoy and visit with family and friends. And if you grow some of your own produce there, all the better. But to me, most of all, it's good for the environment. So my husband and I are both very passionate environmentalists. Um, my husband actually does 90% of the work. I'm the organic eater at my house. I'm the organic painter. I like to paint in my garden. I like to hang out in my garden. I like to read in my garden. Um, and I, I'm, I, since I've started my podcast, so four years ago, my husband and I have been married 25 years. I think I've spent more time working in the garden these last four years than the whole 21 combined. Because on my show, I interview the most inspiring people I've ever met. Most of them are rock star millennials. I love millennials. They work hard. They are doing great things. They care about our planet. And we have 20 acres. But I think you can see almost every single thing in an oasis in this little part of our garden. So somebody said, I think pathways are so important, places to walk, places where people come to visit, their shoes aren't going to get dirty. It also keeps them from stomping on your beds, which I just did an interview with Mandy Girth from Lower Valley Farm uh, for Valentine's Day. She was my special Valentine's Day guest. And she talked a lot about it's really important not to compress your dirt that you grow in. So at their farm, they don't ever, they have permanent beds. They don't ever walk where they're planting their seeds. Um, deep beds, I think, are important when you're growing food. I never knew what a deep bed was, but my mom gardened all the time when I was a kid, but she didn't have any. She still doesn't know, and I feel like that is a huge, um, it will help you be more successful. First of all, deep beds let your roots grow longer, but also um, it just makes all the work easier. So anyway, we've been looking at a picture of one for a long time. Um, now, I really feel like your garden starts in your kitchen. So that's the next thing to write in your cart. What do you like to eat? What do you like to cook? I have talked to a couple of people on my show who said, I don't cook at all. And that's fine, but I usually find most people like to garden because they want to grow their own food. They love the taste of a fresh vegetable. And so, um, what are some things that you guys like to eat? Tomatoes. Tomatoes? 
Carrots. Salad. Potatoes. Lettuce. Potatoes. Potatoes. Kale. Kale. Peppers. Salsa and stew. Peppers. Herbs. Onions. Sugar peas. 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 Uh, so I feel like um, your kitchen usually starts with your produce list, thinking a lot about what do you spend your money on, what do you grow, but I'm also really big, somebody I know said herbs, I'm really big on growing herbs. So like I said, my husband does a lot of the work because I usually have a full-time job and I'm not around enough. But I love herbs because they're easy. They don't take a lot of work. My chives, I think I planted those in like 2001. They're still the first thing the bees go for in the spring. They're really easy. I haven't had to do anything to them ever since 2001. They come back every year. Uh, I don't even really eat chives, but I love the purple flowers. I'm pretty sure you can eat those flowers in your thing, but I know the bees love them. Uh, the other things you can see in this picture, like I have a huge tarragon plant that I have to have like that cage around because it's just so big it's always falling over. This is oregano which grows like a weed in Montana. Yeah. Um, I just can't get enough of it but the bees love it. So thinking about your favorite recipes, what do you use, what do you like to put? Um, I really feel like healthy food starts with healthy soil. Uh, it's definitely been a huge theme on my show, what my guests have talked about a lot. So we build our soil with three ways. We compost, um, we have chickens for the manure. I always say the eggs are the bonus. The chickens are really there to help things grow. And then this year, I really learned a lot about growing our own cover crops, growing green manure. Um, and so I really feel like if you are not composting, if you're not taking care of your food waste, you need to start immediately. And this is something I'm very passionate about, even because a lot of people have told me you're crazy encouraging people to compost. Nobody wants to compost. It's messy. It's, you know, dirty. I don't know. Animal, they're worried animals are going to get into it. We don't have that problem at our house with the animals getting into it. So I've heard people are, that live in cities, maybe more so. I talk about my favorite anniversary present for our 14th wedding anniversary. My husband built me that compost bin right outside my kitchen window. And what I love about it is, um, these boards in front have like these removable slats. And so it's really easy when you want to take the compost out of it. You can just take one off or two off and then it will hold a big bin. It holds that whole wheelbarrow full. In the summer, Mike and I can make like a batch of compost in almost two weeks with a lot of, if we have enough grass cuttings going around, um, like that wheelbarrow full <coughs> that he had there. Um, but you know, the rest of the year, but we just throw our stuff out there all winter long, like every day, just like in the snow and just <coughs> accumulates and, and com um, decomposes together. Uh, this is like in Mike's meat <coughs> farm, that's like another big one we have down there. Just lots of grass clippings, hay, um, any kind of, uh, and I think there's a checklist here of things that you can, and you can get a checklist off of my website that will help you if you're not sure what to put in it. But the big three my husband really feels are strong are um, banana peels, eggshells, coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. Like even if you just save those three, like he just cringes if he cares anybody's throwing those away because we're always looking for compost. We're always looking <coughs> for soil. And it's, it's just like, once you start getting that going and get those piles mixing and get that for your vegetables, you're just gonna feel like, <coughs> You know, there's just nothing better. You can't buy it. Like I just, I just almost feel like if you're throwing your food scraps in the garbage. It's like you're throwing pennies in the ground. So, like, here's my compost components checklist that you can get off of our website. Um, What's your the, website? Uh, just the Organic Gardener Podcast dot com. Okay. Um, so vermiculture, worm composting. One of my guests down in Florida, uh, this friend of mine, Denny Craig, who has a podcast about running. We were talking about. Um, composting and he was telling me well if somebody's stuck we tried verm he well he it's him and his wife and they just have like a little baby and he said they weren't making enough greens to make a compost pile worth it so he said they tried vermiculture 
and he was just it was so easy and so um, usually I am a classroom teacher and so two years ago I was teaching in a second grade and my kids really wanted a class pet and I was like you know what I'm gonna get them a worm bin <laughs> for the class pet because for one thing they were always playing with like one of these other teachers had given me um, like a petunia or mums or something in the fall <coughs> and the plant was gone and the bucket of dirt just sitting in the corner of my classroom I could not keep them out of it they were always playing with those worms in that pot and so I was like all right I'm gonna get them a worm bin and so I got this plastic container and um and we got the worm bin and the best thing about it, I did get them a guinea pig too but the worm bin like you can put the guinea pig bedding in the worm bin and the worms were happy and the guinea pig and didn't like because I taught browning and so I didn't have to worry about you know what was I going to do with it I used to haul all our compost home every weekend that the kids would have in school but this bucket filled up that whole huge tub and you're going to see a lot of pictures I'm sure of that tub I think <laughs> in this powerpoint before you're done of like it's having giant marigolds in it and peppers in it and, like we use that tub a lot the one thing about vermiculture you're not supposed to use a clear bin I mean that big mistake I thought would be cool the kids could see but we had to cover it up because the worms do like a dark bin but I always feel like if I can do it, anybody can do it. Like before I started my podcast, I totally had a brown thumb. I could barely keep my basil plant on my windowsill alive. And now, like, I, I can keep salads alive, I can grow all sorts of things. And if I can make a worm bin, so I feel like if people really don't want to do the composting thing, this is a great, um, you know, like solution for you. And then the bonus green future grower challenge. So I call my listeners green future growers. Like, Maybe there's somewhere you can collect scraps. And I've had guests on who are looking for your scraps. So if you really don't want to get into the composting thing, maybe somebody can find it for you. And if you have any questions, Mike and I, like I said, we're passionate environmentalists. We're here to help. I'm not always the fastest person at answering my emails, but and as long as it doesn't get by me, I use them. So again, chickens, I said, we have our chickens for the manure. The eggs are just a bonus. And, and once you get used to them, like we've had chickens for, I don't know, almost 20 years now, it's hard to not have a chicken. And you don't need a rooster to have a chicken. I mean, to get eggs. Like, even if you just have the hens, <laughs> you'll still get the eggs. Yeah, but you won't get, yeah, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get baby chickens. Um, this is another big thread that's come up in my show a lot. If you're gonna get hay, <clears throat> or you're gonna get manure from a source, make sure it's not, it's not weed free hay. It takes me so long to wrap my head around this because you usually think of something as like chemical free, it's good for you. But weed free hay actually means it's been sprayed with chemicals uh, so the weeds won't grow. So, if, and it kind of depends on the animal. Like Mike was explaining to me, like chicken manure is the best, then sheep, I think, then goats, then, and like horses are down the line. Like chickens, they'll like process it. <coughs> And like there's nothing left but like horses you can practically plant the seeds he said out of their manure like when it goes through their stomach so it kind of depends on where you're getting but now here in Kalispell you guys have a great source um, it's, it's on the Whitefish Stage Road we went and got I think they sell like a hundred bales for what was it 50 I think we paid a hundred dollars for 50 bales a couple years ago I think and so this is our lawn that we have spent We've put so much either manure or like one year they like dug up the fish wildlife from parks people dug up this huge, I don't know, pond and the result is peat they were giving away and just, wow. people are always surprised and I just released an episode this morning on my show, I finally found a landscaper to talk to but the number one question I got last summer was, what do I do with an organic lawn? How do I have an earth friendly landscape? And it's basically the same thing for a vegetable bed, compost, manure, just keep putting those natural things. The guy I talked to down in Texas about, um, he was saying if somebody really needs something to put on the lawn, because I always get that, yeah, but what do I go to the store and buy? He said get molasses and get a jar of molasses. Damn, what did he say? It was like, I think because he has like a hundred gallon tank, so he uses like the whole jar. But um, And he said that's like the best thing you can put on your lawn to get it to turn green, to get it healthier. He talked a lot about mixing um, clover in to your seeds and just trying to have it being really diverse. He talked a lot about people saying, um, like this one mother had a really powerful story about this mother and she's like, but I just had a brand new baby and I want my baby to walk on the lawn. You know, 
babies and pets have a lot smaller parts than we do. Their lungs are smaller than we are. Their livers are smaller than we are. They're closer to the ground. So if you're spraying your lawn with weed and feed, and the woman was like, but I don't want my baby to walk on those weeds. And he's like, why not? He's like, you want your baby to go walk on grass. You want me to spray with chemicals so there's no weeds there. It's like a lot of it's rethinking it. And um, you know, dandelions have a really strong root that will help your grass be, um, be able to get its own water from further down. It's better for, um, like if you have a drought situation, I talk a lot about, we have an orchard, I don't know if I have a picture over here, but one year Mike mowed the lawn around the orchard and all of a sudden you ran out of grass or something, it was like the end of July, and then we never got any more rain until like the end of September, and the part of the orchard where the grass was really tall in the middle was so much greener and so much healthier and able to make it through that whole summer, whereas everything where he had mowed that last pass was like turning brown and was just really struggling. So, oh, cover crops. That's the third way we build our soil. And I interviewed a woman who worked down at the John Jevons Center. Um, John Jevons wrote this book, How to Grow More Vegetables in the Smallest Amount of Space Than You Ever Imagined or something. But they said they grow 60% of their area is growing cover crops, which is really providing food for the soil. Um, some they eat, like quinoa, and amaranth and things, but a lot of what they grow is just to build that soil up, put that nitrogen back in the soil, put um, a lot of things you're taking out. Like corn is known as a feeder uh, vegetable, and so when you plant corn, um, it's going to take more nutrients out of the soil. So Mike says anytime he ever plants corn, he always puts like green beans or some kind of legume after it. So rotating crops is a huge part of being organic. Um, making sure you don't plant the same thing in the same place again because that's more like a monoculture and that's what we're really struggling with in our country. And so this is kind of like what I call his mini farm and the first year that he like took her out, took out the forest land and turned it into farmland, um, you can see like over here he planted this crop of winter wheat and then over here we found like somebody local who had donkeys who wanted his barn cleaned out and so he went and got that many more there. Um, fava beans, another cover crop, so we got to eat the beans and it was good for the soil. So that was his experiment last year. He'd never grown fava beans before. Um, a lot of people ask me about building a green bean teepee. So again, green beans. Now pole beans, Mike says he doesn't grow pole beans anymore because in Montana where we are, they almost always freeze. He says it's just too depressing right in September. Um, the beans just, because they're, it's really a fragile um, plant, can't take any kind of a frost, but, um, so deep beds, he built that one deep bed, what is this, 2007, and then he put the boat next to it. Um, here's my experiment with cover crops, so Anna Hess wrote this book called Homegrown Humus, I think I've read it like six times, I've always been like cover crops, oh my gosh, it sounded so complicated. Um, I didn't think it, I thought it was more for like bigger farms. Um, and then last summer I finally planted, um, like this is going to be our raspberry bed. And buckwheat, so I planted buckwheat. Buckwheat takes about 30 days to grow. So a lot of people talk about putting cover crops in between, like if you pull out your lettuce while you're waiting for maybe before you're going to put your fall crop in, to plant a cover crop in between. And and then there's another thing you've probably heard a lot about, and I'm going to try to go to Todd Luzio, is talking about no-till farming. And so um, it was really hard to cut the buckwheat when it was all flowering and in bloom, and I was just like chopping it, chopping it, I'm like, I'm feeding the soil, I'm feeding the soil, I'm feeding the soil. And then my husband's looking at me, and he's like, seriously, you're not going to turn that in? He's like, you're just going to leave it there? And so then I just dug the holes, and you can barely even tell I planted the raspberries there, there's six brand new raspberry plants there, but that's the new thing, chop and drop. Or I don't know how new it is, but that's basically what no-till, that's where people are trying to go to. So hopefully we'll see how that goes next year. Um, so let's see. Um, so this is part of like the free, the seeds, how I feel like this kind of fits into the food community system because um, like I said, I really don't believe, we don't want to be putting food waste in our, did I talk about that? Like, 
if you're actually throwing your food waste in the garbage instead of in the compost pile, um, it create that's what creates like your greenhouse gases. Compost or food waste that's um, composed decomposes in a compost pile has lots of air. That if you or if you get lots of air, that was another thing with the slats is that it lets lots of air flow, and then you're not going to have the smell, and it's going to make sure it decomposes naturally. Yeah, and then you're getting your methane release. So I feel like this fits into the freeze the seeds community food system because we're not putting that out there. We're recovering our food loops. Um, and then again, this is part of my Green Future Grower challenge because I've had a few people, one, like as far opposite as they could be. One's in Washington, one's in Florida, but they both like have neighborhood compost pickups where they go around and they collect their neighbors scraps and then they build one compost pile and then you can either if you want compost you can say yeah I'll have it back or if you just want to donate it to your neighbors. So one thing I talk about a lot is water. My husband and I lived for six years when we first got married without running water. Um, and we still always seem to have limited amounts of water and so I think it's really important that you have your um, sources of water are convenient. Like Watering on a hot sunny afternoon can be really nice in Montana. We certainly have long days, but <clears throat> you've got to do it every day. I don't know how many times my husband's always telling me, did you water? Did you water? You've got to go water again. It's really important to think about how much water. We've had a lot of things that died or didn't make it, like our blueberry plants and things. Um, but when I first went to David Schmetterling's website and saw that picture, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. I thought he was like way out in the middle of the woods. Nowhere, and he's actually right smack in the middle of Missoula. And him and his wife um, grow this beautiful garden here. But the only thing they actually water are their vegetables, which, because they're in Missoula and they have a farmer's market, like a food store, and all sorts of places, they really just mostly grow, like, I think he said, like Thai basil and hot peppers and like specialty foods. Like, they don't really grow a lot of vegetables. And then that beautiful garden is all just. Um, watered from like natural rainfall. So he really talked about sources of native plants. I know there was a person downstairs that's got a native plant boost. There's lots of native things that you can use in your yard to, um, that don't require a lot of watering. Whereas there's lots of other plants that you can bring in that are gonna require a ton of attention, a ton of watering. And anything that takes a lot of watering, I don't really like. <laughs> So mice make deep beds out of like everything you can imagine. You don't have to have fancy wood. Um, he's recycled things. Oh yeah, another thing I like about the deep beds is you can build these little plastic covers for them because you know in Montana, <coughs> we've had frosts as early as like August 23rd, I think. Usually about September 7th, September 8th is about when we really get hit up at our place. Uh, I don't know, did I mention that, that I'm up in Eureka? Uh, let's see, so somebody asked me um, when I was working on, like, we just came out with a book and my brother was reading the proof and he's like, well, what's with the deep beds? So I think the biggest reason deep beds rock is you can sit around the edges and weed and harvest and do that. But it also, um, you know, it helps you get the best quality soil in a certain space. Like I said before, it keeps people from compacting your because you're not walking, you know, next to it. It'll keep some animals out, like gophers and things. Sometimes it kind of just depends. I mean, you don't want to let, uh, you want to try to keep those critters out. That's something that people, a lot of people struggle with. One of the best things people have told me for keeping, um, like, deer and things out is, like, hanging, like, pans that make a lot of noise. I mean, Mike has our big fence now, so we don't really have as big of a problem with deer. One thing that did happen last spring, and we argued all summer about it, was Somehow the gate got left open and the deer got in there and ate his tomatoes and some other things like in the early spring. But I was like, isn't that better than if it would have happened in August? So I don't know. Uh, I felt like it made us much more vigilant the rest of the summer. Um, Biointensive method, which is where you plant your plants uh, closer to the. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but part of the biointensive method is planting more vegetables in a small amount of space so that they kind of shade the weeds um, and then or by shading the soil the weeds won't be able to grow uh, they can make longer roots 
There's something else I was thinking. So, um, things to think about, location, where you're going to put it, making sure you have enough sun, uh, what kind of space you have, what kind of materials you want to use. People used to use, um, you know, like creosote, like the old uh, train tracks things, but then they realized that the creosote will, you know, just make sure your materials are safe if you're using any kind of recycled materials. Um, there's that tub again with the peppers in them. Fill it with the best dirt you can. Compost, some straw on top. Um, so this is another big thing, like the no-till that people have been talking a lot about, is just putting cardboard down um, instead of like digging that up underneath and pulling out all the weeds. Um, just putting a layer of car cardboard down and then filling it with as much good dirt as you possibly can. So that's the bed I actually put that buckwheat in. I was showing you before. But here's like a boat Mike made a bed out of. He wanted to make that boat for so long. And then finally one year, he did it. But you can see it. I mean, look at those plants on the road. They just did a great job. So um, here's my brand new vegetable gardener challenge. So if you've never grown a vegetable before, this is what I would suggest you start with. Now, again, I said, you should start with things that you really like to eat. So if you don't like lettuce, I wouldn't start with lettuce. But to me, these are some of the <coughs> easiest crops to grow. Um, if you're like me and you're busy and you want to go hiking, I mean, there'll be days in the summer where I won't see the garden for four or five days. So fortunately, I have a mic there to water it. But if you don't, so lettuce and peas are going to come out early in the spring. Um, they should be done by July. We usually have our peas eaten, sugar snap peas, by the 4th of July. We're usually picking them right in there. Um, <coughs> I mean, lettuce can grow longer, but the good thing, so lettuce, carrots, peas, you can put those all in pretty much the first week in April, second week in April. I noticed, Mike, like I went back and looked through our journals, and almost everything he's planted, because lettuce is like one of the first things goes in the ground, is usually between the April 10th and April 14th. So um, you can put all three of those things in in the beginning, the carrots, they're going to take the whole summer to grow, but um, I just think that's a really good place to start because they're pretty easy. You'll probably be successful with all of them. And then if you want to take the rest of the summer off and you don't want to deal with your garden in August, you don't really have to. There's not going to be that much work. Um, I always love to have a cherry tomato plant in Montana. A lot of times tomatoes are not going to grow ripe. We bring them in when they're green, but it's just not as successful. Whereas a cherry tomato, you're probably going to get to pick. A lot of, you know, eat most of the cherry tomatoes, they're going to go right. Um, and then if you're going to go for in that, fruit trees, fruit bushes. Uh, just, there's so much produce you can get back and you can't plant a fruit tree soon enough. It's an asset that's going to make your property worth more and um, it will just keep bringing back fruit year after year after year. Uh, so like either uh, apple trees or raspberry bushes. I'm really big on raspberry bushes myself. Uh, this is something that took me forever to figure out, the difference between an annual and a perennial, and I think that's probably because Mike does most of the gardening. Um, but that's a huge marigold right there, and I think it gets huge because he puts them in his deep beds. So an <coughs> annual is something you have to plant every single year. You've got to put those seeds in, you've got to take them out. A perennial will come back, every, like you just plant it once and then it's in the ground for good. And this is important because you don't want to put your annuals and your perennials in the same beds. So um, these are examples of annual vegetables that can go in the ground as soon as the ground can be worked. So I don't know why it has a picture of tomatoes there because tomatoes are definitely not that. But like arugula, beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots. Kale, lettuce, parsnips, potatoes, radishes, spinach, spring mix, and Swiss chard. Spinach does come back, but uh, it's still considered an annual. And it's only going to come back, I think, one year. Or, I don't know. I guess as long as it keeps dropping the seeds. Um, vegetables that have to go on the ground after danger of frost. Beans, and kind of green beans, purple. My kids, my students love those purple strip striped dragon's tongue beans. I don't have a picture of them here, but they were always asking about those. Corn, eggplant, squash, tomatoes, zucchinis. And I'm pretty sure Mike puts 
the green beans, the corn, and the squash all directly in the ground. The eggplant, the tomatoes, and the zucchini. No, zucchini would be squash, so he puts that directly in the ground. But eggplant and tomatoes, he always starts inside first. So he has like plants that are growing around. Um, some examples of cover crops. Amaranth, barley, buckwheat, clover, oilseed, radishes. Uh, oats, peas, quinoa, rye, sunflowers, sun hemp, sweet potatoes, and winter wheat. Examples of annual flowers, calendula, although our calendulas come up every single year, but they're listed as an annual. Cosmos, marigolds, nasturtium, snapdragon, sunflowers, zinnias. These are all great flowers. If you put these flowers in your garden, even um, if you're not planning on picking them and you're not like interested in flowers, they're still going to make your vegetables, you have bigger yields of vegetables. You're going to get more tomatoes, you're going to get more broccoli because they're going to bring in the pollinators. Um, so those are some great annuals. Also, like nasturtiums and marigolds are, um, for some reason, a lot of pests don't like the smell of them. So they're going to like repel a lot of pests that would normally eat your kale or your spinach. Um, annual herbs, basil, cilantro, dill, although our dill generally comes up on its own. <laughs> Garlic you have to plant every year. Uh, perennials. These are my favorites. Talk about low maintenance. Beautiful. They smell good. The bees love them. The pollinators love them. The beneficials love them. The, um, so chives, echinacea, lavender, mint, oregano, rosemary, sage, tarragon, thyme. Uh, I think the reason I put the ones in purple is they're maybe a little easier to grow. No, that can't be because mint is super easy to grow. Mm -hmm. And rosemary is not easy, at least not for me. Now that <coughs> rosemary plant my friend Nola has, it's like thriving. It's huge. It's like the biggest plant you've ever seen. And she lives right near me. So I think it kind of depends on who you are. But sage, I've had really good luck with sage. I've had super luck with oregano. Uh, the chives, again, like I said. Lavender, I struggle with like crazy. Echinaceas, Mike finally planted me some in there doing well. Flowers are really nice that come from bulbs because they will spread really easily. That's something I can do, like take a batch of viruses. I mean, they're pretty much, they're pretty simple to just, you dig them up, break the roots apart, and you can move them. And they're really nice because they just multiply and multiply. So you really only have to buy them like the first year. And then you'll get like two the next year, and then you'll get four, and then sit, you know they just keep multiplying. Uh, that's just a picture of perennials where people will, the birds and bees. Flowering plants like asters, I love those blanket flowers. And there's probably seven, I think there's like seven butterflies. You can't see very well in that picture on those blanket flowers. Um, daisies, echinacea, harebells, hostas, lilies, peonies. Peonies are one of the only plants the deer have not eaten the peonies at our house that are outside the fence. It's kind of nice for Montana. Fruit trees, apples, blueberries, peaches, pears, plums, rhubarb. Uh, biennials. So biennials take two years to complete their lifestyle. Life. Oh, Mike told me like 20 times. He's like, that's supposed to say life cycle. Um, and they tend to bloom every other year, biennials. But like these are still coming back. And I think Mike planted those in like 2000, I don't know, like 2003, 2005. Especially these are like sweet williams down here. Um, he did say the foxgloves, I think, are maybe poisonous to the like, cats or something. He told me that. I was like, well, we should take that out. But um, the forget-me-nots, the hollyhocks are really pretty. So these, I think, are better for people who are super busy um, because they're much more low maintenance. And they're so pretty. And they bring in the pollinators. Uh, carrots are a biennial. They take two years to produce seed. Um, so that's just kind of a primer on perennials, annuals, and biennials. I probably completely confused you. Like I said, it took me about six years to get to know that. So again, this is our little peace sign garden. Mike got me that peace sign when I graduated from college. And why did I want this picture in there? I just feel like it has like all the parts. Like it's got the dill, it's got the marigolds, here's the lettuce. So I do say you shouldn't put perennials and annuals in the same beds. But like this bed of lettuce is is a little bit away from that bed of flowers, but it's just like you wouldn't want to have herbs in here with your lettuce because 
you're going to pull all that lettuce out at the end, whereas the perennials are just going to keep coming back. Um, Mike always talks about corn grows in a square, like that's always something that just like kind of, I don't know why I have the hardest time wrapping my head around that too. I'm like, why does it have to be in a square? But I don't know, there's just something about it. Fall gardens is another thing that took me forever to learn. Because I always think a fall garden, I'm going to plant it in September, but really in Montana, you're probably going to start planting it like the beginning of June. Maybe the end. I mean, no, the beginning of July. Certainly by July 25th. I think that's when I planted that lettuce last year, was like July 25th, and it did pretty good. But I, for so long, I'd be like, all right, it's time to plant the fall garden in September, and that is just way too late. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, fencing, it's super important to protect your beds. I don't know, maybe I've gone too long. How much more do I have? Because I want to give you time to ask questions if you have questions. Uh, we talked a little bit about companion planting. Um, like I said, Mike never plants. He always plants, like with his tomatoes, marigolds. Like, look how tiny that baby marigold is, and that'll grow into one of those huge plants. Ooh, what happened? Um, nasturtiums are good for brassicas, broccoli, broccoli. Um, garlic, who knew? Garlic's a companion plant for roses. I didn't know that until this year, but it helps keep white aphids, ants, even snails. It can help prevent fungal diseases. Um, dill and basil protect your tomatoes from hornworms. Rosemary can deter purifies. Broccoli is a natural fungicide and protects strawberries. Um, and it's just basically because the companion plants don't like the odors. Or, I mean, the pests don't like the odors that the companion plants put So, what does that say? Geraniums and marigolds will deter beetles and cabbage moths. Um, I was just reading about this again this morning. Somebody was showing their pictures of the three sisters where you have corn, and it's kind of hard to see, but like you can kind of see like here's the green beans crawling up that big stalk of corn and like totally had wrapped around it. So the beans provide the nitrogen for the soil. The squash is supposed to shade the ground so it's preventing weeds. And then it also makes um, a balanced meal, squash, beans, and corn. Uh, I think the best guide on companion plants is that John Jevons book that I was showing you in the beginning about um, the cover crops. I have a question. Yeah. Do you start your seeds in a greenhouse? So like tomatoes, um, zinnias, marigolds, uh, broccolis, cabbages, anything that can't go in the ground before June, Mike starts inside. And then... Um, Things like uh, well, like lettuce, he will put directly in the ground as soon as the ground can be worked. It just kind of depends on what kind of seeds they are and how long they take, what their you know how long their growing time is. Um, so beets go directly in the ground. 